and welcome to the Behind the Dunes podcast. I'm your host, Connor, and I'm here today with Daniel Moskowitz. Your victim. Our newest victim. Um, so, Daniel, you're the broker in charge here at Dunes Real Estate. Um, list off your other accomplishments, achievements. I am a father of two wonderful children. I have a wonderful wife, and uh, I've come from a nice family, and I don't know, I'm kind of, uh, what do you call it, what would you say, a steel jacket? Yeah. Hard to break through, so we're going we're, we're, we're gonna to try to make that happen, right? Yeah. Today? Um, outside of that, no, I, my, my life is just trying to surround myself with uh, awesome people, learn from them. Went to NC State University, did a little corporate sales post you know, when I graduated, economics, and uh, yeah, found myself uh, in the real estate world in 2005, intentional, uh, intentionally pursuing real estate, was going to go to Charleston, and uh, I met someone along the way through uh, a hobby of mine, racing cars, and he offered me to shatter them for a week, uh, and that was back in 05. They offered me a job, convinced me why Hilton Head was a better place to pursue a real estate career than Charleston. They were accurate on that, and uh, goodness, that was uh, 17 years ago, and, and counting, so... Yeah, if you forgot yeah, one main like list of accomplishments, I was born <laughs> amateur drone pilot. Oh yeah, yeah. Thanks to uh, uh, an influence on camera, yeah. I, I opted to uh, test my racing skills to the sky, and so far it's uh, in one piece. And hopefully, we can share some of those video clips of uh, the the, the in, in intense approach to the low country, right? Yeah. So rewind a little bit. Um, you were born in North Carolina? Born in North Carolina, just okay. outside of Charlotte, small town called Gastonia. If you know it, you don't go with the reputation. <laughs> so you were born in North Carolina, you went through high school there, and then you went to NC State. Yep. Um, what made you choose NC State? Um, interestingly enough, uh, gosh, back to racing, um, they had a you – know, I, I was running a series – um, called Legends Cars uh, at that time, mm -hmm. actually between that and some late model trucks. Um, and NC State, among a few other uh, colleges, had had a uh, racing team. And so I was like, you know, that's what I'll do. And, um, you know, I had no idea what I wanted to do uh, when I grew up. And uh, I still don't, as does everyone in, in it seems in every profession, everybody had the privilege of encountering. I asked that question, what do you want to do when they grow, you grow up? And no matter the age, it's, I don't know yet, right? Or I'm not sure. Um, or I'll decide when I get there. Uh, so I, I've, I fell into that category, but everyone always said, you know, because racing, you should do engineering. I mean, yeah. you love cars, you love fabricating, you love setting it up, you get it. Yeah, no, the curriculum, nah, uh, not at all. And yeah. The, the objects rotational in space when at a certain point in time, the force is due to gravity, what amount of volume of their surface areas overlapped and cumbered uh, wasn't for me. And uh, my grades were starting to reflect it. And so quickly did a, a shift to one of the classes I loved, uh, which was economics and going from high level mathematics to business mathematics made for a drastic GPA improvement. And so it was great. It was great, um, you know, having that experience at NC State. So, yeah, looked at different colleges and, you know, uh, of those that were, say, closer to where I could maybe do a little racing while in school. And, um, you know, it's a great school for engineering, great school for business, but, you know, that, that, that was the driver at the time. It made sense. So, yeah, that's that's why NC State. Now I'm not a sports fan. I'm fair weather. Um, I was there during the good years of Phillip Rivers. Um, and uh, But outside of that, couldn't tell you much about athletics. My friends would all attest to that. <laughs> so it seems like racing 
holds a pretty big uh, spot in your life, pretty big influence. How did you get into that? Um, it was a hobby of my father's. So growing up, um, it was, you know, he would, uh, yeah, it was a hobby of his kind of growing up, though he found his way uh, into it through neighbors, no one direct in the family. Um, it was pretty cool to have dad doing that. And when I was younger, I was more so bored. Um, we'd go to the track and I didn't have any interest. And then um, as I got a little older and, you know, maybe saw some kids driving cars and um, also watching in somewhat frustration, looking at the tasks they were doing, whether it be changing a tire, or setting up the car, or replacing wreck parts, um, thinking I could do it a lot faster. Uh, I, I managed to get my hands dirty. In fact, my dad was working uh, one day and he said, you know, here you go. Uh, or well, actually he didn't say here you go. Usually what I do is maybe clean the car during the week, but I understood, you know, this is how you, you fix a car and you have all the new parts, you have all the old parts and in a race car, you're more so tuning it to a certain setup that in the end you do use tools for measurement. But in this particular case, um, you know, what I did was simply, you know, it's a lower steering rod, how many turns out off the Heim, you know, 10 and get the new one, 10 turns back on, you know, pretty logical, right? So I never saw that as intimidating. In most cases in life, it's if I can figure out how to get it apart, uh, I pretty much know how to put it back together. And if something's not working, I'll continue to take it apart till I find the part that's broken, then put it back together. I can uh, attest to this. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I'm, a, I'm a victim of that uh, lack of restraint, right? <laughs> so I'll get into anything, but in any case, yeah, that's, that's kind of how it kicked off. And so, um, yeah, yeah, gradually I kind of took over the, the setup of the cars, loading them in the trailer and things like that. I would come home from work. We'd go to the track. It'd be fun to watch them perform. It'd be fun to make a difference or impact on the performance and handling of the car, and, uh, and, and then eventually I was able to get behind the wheel and have a lot of fun. And yeah, so that, that was, that was it. Do you guys right? still go to the track together or like yeah. drive together and stuff like that? Yeah. Um, the last two times I've, uh, or the last probably two years, we've, we've gone up to Virginia International Raceway together and, um, rented some high performance cars and gotten on track there. Um, it's kind of easier when someone else is repairing it. And, you know, these schools and programs, they have a great uh, formula racing school up there. And, you know, to, to dabble in something that you're less familiar with, I was more so grew up in the, of course, North Carolina, uh, oval track stock car scene, but yep. uh, more recently transitioned into uh, the thrill of the downforce and uh, more winged vehicles. And so, uh, yeah, I got to dabble with that the past uh, few years up there. And um, But it's it's always fun to go to the track with him. Do you guys ever race against each other or race with each other? Um, yeah, so we, it was pretty neat. There was a series when I was in high school <clears throat> called Thunder Roadsters and they were launching, it was a production class out of the, by the way, should I look at the camera at all during this? It doesn't matter. No, we're just having a conversation. It just so happens to be. Right. I just noticed filmed. there was a camera. Yeah. And there's something on your head. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Now, jumping back to it. Um, production series. Oh, and that translates through? Oh, so yeah. They heard that? Okay, good, good. Uh, classing it up. <clears throat> um, the production series has these cars, and we were uh we had been in, so involved in the legends that there was a scenario where more or less we were provided two cars as long as we ran a certain number of races throughout the Southeast. It was my first experience in road course racing off the ovals and it was a ton of fun. Um, and it was the first time in a division where I was running and racing with dad. So I have great memories. You know, at most tracks we are kind of, we, you know, they, they bunch you in a class with a bunch of different cars mm -hmm. and, and our times would be different. And generally, we wouldn't be tied together 
in the race. Um, but we went down to Daytona, and what was pretty fun is <clears throat> there was a little bit of a uh, infield, you know, bumping and banging on the first lap. Um, the cars went everywhere, uh, you know, and some that were faster, whether by legal car or not, uh, than my dad and I. But it was fun because the whole remainder of the race, you know, you're on a big track and you're drafting, right? Uh, basically, it's an engine that reaches its limitations on being able to go any faster. But right when you put two in line and take away the drag, it becomes pretty awesome how they'll, you know, go just a little bit faster. And so we were able to kind of team up and remain ahead and, and capture first and second working together. That was a good memory. Uh, other times. Shake and bake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other times I've uh, been witness to him uh, out there with some, he was out, one of our friends, uh, Marty Williams was with him on the uh, main straightaway in Virginia, Virginia National Raceway. And, um, their bumpers got locked together, you know, at, at, I don't know, 120 or so miles an hour. And so I'm just kind of sitting over there, you know, I'm doing the same, but I'm obviously off of them. I see what's happened and you're just kind of spectating, like, I wonder what's going to happen here, you know, <laughs> and I hope we don't have to clean this up and, and just under hard breaking and somewhat pure luck, uh, they came, came, came unglued, uh, before, uh, you know, that kind of, you, you aren't going to make the turn moment. So, um, but fun to be out there, fun to have those experiences with him. I enjoyed, uh, I probably enjoyed more so standing and watching and, and rooting for him, you know, on the sidelines and, and being a part of making his individual car a success than I did, you know, necessarily competing against him. Right. Right. Or with him. So after NC State, mm -hmm. where does the road take you next? The road, um, I did. So during college, I entered at a company. It was selling an accounting tool. Mm -hmm. And I was at the time, it, it was kind of like early AI-ish uh, technology where, yeah, this would have been 2000, intern 2003, four, right, and eventually worked for um, it basically translated financial statements into plain English written analysis. And, uh, I, I, I tell you what, I, I love so many of the CPAs I had the opportunity to work for, but generally speaking it, uh, you know, booking appointments, hopping on a plane to go pitch a product and surrounding my day with uh, deep conversations with, with accountants was, <laughs> was ultimately not, not not going to be my long-term career. I'm sure those conversations were very fun. Well, hey, you know what? I, I'm an analytical, so we probably had more in common uh, than you'd think, um, which, which, so I, you know, it's cool when you have one of those new great products and you're in sales and coming out of college, it was the opportunity to, of course, make more money initially, um, get my life going, um, you know, financially. Uh, but, you quickly learn in life what what gets you excited, right? What 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 you can do, and where you find that natural energy, and uh, and and where you don't. And what I realized the most in that was not so much the product, not so much the passion uh, for the product or for the audience. It was the I didn't like to hop on a plane and travel all the time. Uh, to stay in hotels overnight. I admire the people that do and are able to do that. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say I'm a homebody, but I really love to be around where I live, uh, experience lifestyle and community. And that kind of uh, corporate sales life uh, didn't suit me. And so I found myself quickly, um, and, and it was actually on a flight back from London. I had early successes, and so I got to live in London for about two months, um, largely from being relatively successful early on, but more so from the fact that the team they sent over there that didn't have work visas uh, were captured at the airport <laughs> with all their phones and all their technology and all their everything <clears throat> because they gave, well, more uh, 
specific answers to customs uh, that they they should not have, uh, or no, they should have. Uh, but anyway, it was a bit of a debacle. So they were able to straighten things out, and we were able to make it over there legally, um, and or at least I was told that. And so yeah, um, but it was on the plane ride back from that that uh, I was like, you know what, I was. Born and raised going to Charleston. I love the environment of Charleston. I want to change up of pace. And, and I've always been fascinated with the world of real estate just from like houses, like being around people, like the idea of being around people who are in a certain place in life where they're looking to have more fun and expand on their you know family memories, looking to, you know, retire, um, you know, at, at an end point, want to be in an environment where people are generally happy, right? Charleston seemed like that place and, and you know, the livelihood and the culture. Um, and, and so back to racing, back to their earlier story, there was someone that I had raced with uh, when I was about 17. <clears throat> he had one of those million dollar real estate sales business cards and, um, you know, had the oceanfront uh, hole. Robert Trent Jones being from Gastonia, hearing a million dollars is, you know, I mean, that, that that was insane at the time. Like, you know, a number that you just jaw open, can't fathom. And then uh, the beauty of, of course, the oceanfront hole uh, um, here in Palmetto Dunes, looking out on the back of the card was super cool, right? And so it made an impression anyway, and we had seen each other racing throughout. And so when I got back, I was like, I'm done, you know, not going to do this, going to pursue real estate. What's it like? He shared with me a few things, and then, um, and he knew I was planning to go to Charleston with my familiarity with that area. But then he uh, offered me to shadow him for a week and offered me a job at the end of it. So... My second time really coming to Hilton Head was when I moved here for work, right? First time to shadow. So nobody else in your family did real estate? No one. Okay, no. so you're the, the first one into it? That's pretty cool. Yeah, in, t- in, in terms of a trade, um, like practice trade, um, uh, of course, <clears throat> buying and selling stuff from um, – grandfather being a cattle auctioneer to, uh, you know, uh, family buying and selling properties along the way. I did have some exposure. But it's not like you came from like a family of realtors. So. Right, That's right, cool. right. No bro- no licensees. Yeah. So yeah. second time ever coming down here is when you moved down here. That's correct. What was it like coming from Gastonia? I've never been to Gastonia, so I don't know what it's like there. I mean, it, you, you know, you drop your jaw. It, I, I remember it began, it seemed like 278 was this endless, you know, lush green golf course. Even the median, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the absence of visible power lines to, you know, and, and you get a little jaded here because you start to recognize when stuff's not maintained, yep. <laughs> you know, in the median and things yep. like that. But then you forget, you know, then, then you relive like we're doing now, that memory of the first time you're exposed to it. And so, um, but yeah, I remember uh, pulling off of 95 onto 278 and, um, I think they were just finishing up the college out there then. Um, but it seemed like, yeah, it was just, I mean, sorry, what you know, year, what year did you come here? Uh, that, that would have been 2005, 2005. Okay. Yeah. So that was uh, summer of 2005 <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, so from that to, of course, you know, everybody knows the feeling when you see the water and the, the natural area, the natural beauty, but you saw all these signs. Then you saw homes that were giant, magnificent. You, 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 you know, of course, there's the prospects of a, a, a successful real estate career that, you know, are, are, are distant, but you, you know, see the opportunity more, more in your horizon when, when you're immersing yourself in it and uh you can't help but you know almost immediately once you enter any of the communities on hilton head feel that uh i mean by comparison with gastonia the grandioseness 
uh, of uh, many of the the homes, the structures, the communities, <clears throat> and um, yeah, yeah, it was uh, it is beautiful. Bluffton wasn't much of anything in, in terms of uh, I mean that was almost twenty years ago, and it's blossomed and it's it's magnificent. It, it certainly wasn't dirt roads. Um, I mean, even from when I've lived here, Bluffton has expanded yeah. exponentially in 10 years. Yeah. I think so. Bali Field was uh, dirt roads when I moved here, or several of the roads were still dirt, um, or some of them. And maybe over in the Burks Bradley area, they were still paving some of those. But for the most part, it was what? They were still paving roads? Yeah, yeah, and laying wow. sewer lines and, and, and yeah, and some. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, and, and no power lines overhead, and then, yeah, generally speaking, the the people, everybody was just, I mean, not that people in my hometown weren't nice, but you know, it was. It was people are generally solid. much nicer here than than ev- pretty much everywhere else that I've ever been to. Yeah, I think it's just because everybody's happier. Yeah, yeah. No. Uh, yeah. So. How, how was your real estate career when it first started? Like, was it difficult to adjust to real estate from how you were doing your other was sales job? Oh, yeah, entirely different. I mean, I really, even today, you can get a license and you have no idea what you're doing, right? And that's that's what's, that's the problem with the industry um, or the opportunity with the industry as well. And certainly something that... Um, you know, we try to um, really be aware of in terms of agents we bring on board and um, any training or resources that uh, we, we deliver and, and, and provide. Um, because it, 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 yeah, I didn't know. I mean, I understood the marketing element, right? I, I got that aspect uh, with a little bit of the corporate background. But, um, and I understood the people and the engagement right? And the keeping up and, and those aspects. But I didn't really understand, I mean, even how the, the purchases, the, you know, the acquisitions, how things, how you navigated the processes, what you needed to know, what you needed to look out for. I didn't know about the structure of all the financials of different communities and uh, the owner obligations, the owner consequences, the liabilities, the, you know, all the intrinsic details that are encompassed in every real estate transaction knew none of that. <clears throat> I was still learning what, you know, a, 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 yeah, the, the different club lifestyles. I'd never heard of initiation fees, trans, well, transfer fees, you know, capital reserve, uh, capital improvement. Um, didn't know, yeah, setback lines, elevation, um, all the things that are super relevant in our area. Didn't know about any of those. Um, then you have to learn, you know, of course, <clears throat> all the vendors you work with, how you work with them. And I was, I'm appreciative of the fact that in my initial experience uh, with what at the t- time was the top producing uh, team, I was somewhat, I wasn't feet to the fire. I, it wasn't thrown to the wolves, but I, I, I'm not good with expressions. I was thrown in the mix, right? So um, that was a pretty good one. From marketing, thanks. From marketing to um, taking clients around, uh, sh- to opening doors, to showing houses, to and not really, <clears throat> don't really know what I'm showing here, but I'm going to come in, I'm going to turn the lights on, I'm going to ask you questions, I'm going to find out the answers and solutions. But in that particular circumstance, of course, there was someone else they were going to to facilitate the contract and all the details of the negotiation, which was appropriate. So I was getting that kind of exposure initially understanding the prospecting side of it uh, a little further as it related to real estate and then the contract side of it and then of course how a brokerage works right all foreign to me at the time so yeah i i um but the dynamics of the job the quickly identifying all the different people and the different types of people in the sphere of influence down here and, and the influential influence right was super cool I mean, just people in the professions and the, you know, just genuine interest in, you know, who they were and 
what they wanted and I was immediately enticed by the the idea of like fulfillment and satisfaction figuring out what they wanted right and uh, of course it was also through the time of the end of that economic boom and into the the you know 2006 seven eight uh, housing uh, collapse that you know it was really kind of the timeline I was you know seeing everything so I saw, just a glimpse of the end of the heyday and none of that. Um, everybody said to me, oh, you wanted to get in on the, you know, the money-making aspect of it. And, you know, or that's why you, you jumped into real estate at the time you did. No, it was just a sequence of events. I didn't know what the potential upside was. Right. I knew you could make a decent listening, living. I knew you can make a great living in any profession. Um and, and, you know, there's starting points, there's ending points, there's uh, points where you transition, you know, for fulfillment in life. But at, at no point was, you know, money the idea behind what I wanted to do. But I wanted to learn a lot. So <clears throat> my, for that first job, you know, it was like s- sweat equity and knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people along the way were, were you know, um, it gave me indications of maybe what I should have been compensated for, but in hindsight, I, I look back and say, okay, well, the wealth of knowledge that uh, even may have, you know, influenced my being in the position I'm in now, uh, I gained a lot. But during the week, I would, um, you know, whether it's running around, helping to show, getting keys, chasing stuff down, you know, contracts, getting those filled out or processed or, or whatever, or working on some of the marketing, uh, but sometimes at nights and then on the weekends, I was preparing uh, you know, this person's uh, race car and then towing it throughout the Southeast. And uh, I'd say one of their best years ever in racing was that year. Um, all the equipment, everything uh, held together. But yeah, so there, there wasn't much, much room, uh, much time for rest, resting. Uh, even even with the transitioning of the market over that period of time, but after about a year and a half, I um, you know recognized that all the things I didn't know about the profession, I, I knew a lot more of enough to where I had a good foundation and and under the broker in charge at the time, um, Bill Baldwin, when it was Dunes Marketing Group, um, went to him and said, you know, I, th- I think I'm at the point, you know, w- with some other factors that were also in place that um, I may learn more independently uh, than, than working in this team and are there opportunities for that. And uh, he was very welcoming. Um, so wanted to stay within the same company because always the people have been magnificent and it's, and wanted to surround myself with, uh, these people and um, you know continue to learn but this time in my own independent way yeah right? so that's uh, so no I didn't know what I was getting into and I immediately jumped into it was thrust into it in, in a sense and then yeah yeah was felt enough confidence after a year and a half and a lot of exposure uh, to go and you know risk someone's biggest asset on my own uh, on my own discretion, right? Um, How did you feel after your first transaction? Um, I was excited, right? Um, had the privilege of of helping a friend acquire a home, and 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 that was really nice. Um, or there was a villa, and you know, satisfying. Um, they were there and was looking forward to uh, more so like the celebration get together at the house and like giving them the gift and it being official. And then them, you know, like staying there, that's your home now, here you go, here's the keys. And, uh, you know, there was that, there was the handoff. And then, of course, earlier in your career, it's, it's you don't tend to have things coming in abundance, right? Yep. There was that. That was fun. That was great. Now I got to start all over and find somebody else to help, right? <laughs> uh, you know, 
Because you consume yourself, like if you care about it, um, as you're learning, you, you, you get so consumed with having everything figured out. There, no, there being no stumbling blocks, you trying to anticipate every single move of the client and something like, or, or, or of the client in the process, and the dynamics of the transaction, that it's very hard to multitask or, you know, be able to move and keep the prospecting going and, and building. And, and so it was, yeah, it was, um, it, it was, it was, yeah, like anything, I, I remember the excitement uh, for my friend, for um, their parents and uh, the whole process. And, you know, my, my uh, well, girlfriend at the time, um, a, a wife now, uh, Laren, to her, her excitement and enthusiasm for it as well, because, you know, we're all, all friends together. And, uh, yeah, then boom. Oh, boy. You know, I, I definitely don't have any income on the way. Um, and, and I really got to get more things in the pipeline. Right. And there's no sort of course in my prior role that I referred to as indentured servitude. There was some drip income. <laughs> right. And there's a bonus structure in place. But, um, you know, when it's your own bills and you've got all your mandatory dues, you've got your insurance, you've got there's your, so many dues. Yeah. I never yeah. realized it until Karina got into it. Yeah. But like she was showing me like you got to pay this, this. And I was like. Are you serious? Yeah. There's yeah. so much. Yeah, you've got to be able to access the data, so that's that. Yeah. Then you've, you know, the, the resources and the uh, value in the Realtors Association is tremendous. Uh, and you've got to be a part of that when and you want to. Um, and then, of course, you know, you, 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 there's always the unpredictable in the business. And so anybody with a reasonable business plan is going to make the investment with the you know, insurance and, um, yeah, and that's just the start. That doesn't mean you have a client. That doesn't mean you yep. have a car. That doesn't mean you, uh, you know, get gas to drive around. Yeah. And, and you got to brand yourself, market yourself and figure it out. You have to fail. You, you, you have to find success. And it's, it's not something you, pre you're prepared for by watching Bravo or, um, you know, is it Bravo or TLC that those shows are on? One of the two. All of them. Yeah, probably uh, both. Yeah, then you've got it on Netflix now. I mean, the, the, there's a glorious side of the profession, no doubt. Uh, there, there's the shiny, sparkly moments. But there's, you know, that's, that's absolutely not what real life is. Not real life is. Uh, We're going to sidebar real quick. Yep. Have you watched any <laughs> of those shows on Netflix? Um, no, not on Netflix. Okay. Yeah. Don't. No, okay. It's... It's bad. Okay. Uh, thanks. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll save you some. Perfect. I'll some, read this. Some time. Check the cliff notes. But yeah, no, um, I mean, you, you see it and you see it in a good market. And anytime there's a low barrier to entry profession uh, with high stakes and high reward, you're going to get a ton of people in there. And I, I don't, I mean, like anything, heck, I wanted to be a race car driver, right? And. Uh, I mean, you still are. Yeah. 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 The full time. Yeah. Um, I, uh, but you know, not everybody makes it to the top and even those at the top, it's, it's, it's not necessary, always a glorious lifestyle and there's a lot of risk. Um, same thing, real estate, just, uh, a greater likelihood, uh, for success, right? You aren't one of however many NFL teams or NBA or, you know, cup or F1 teams or whatever your fancy might be. But, um, yeah, it, it's, it's one of those 10% do 90% of the business. And, and even so, there's huge investment type stakes in, in, in it for the clients. And yeah, so uh, I, I forget. I can't even remember what the question was. Is it going into the business surprises? <laughs> it was just talking <laughs> about your first year of yeah. real estate. Um, when did you meet your now wife? Uh, like literally the first week I was down here. One of the missions of that job, I went over to uh, competing brokerage to pick up the key. And 
you know, you got to remember it was my second time down here. I knew how to get from where I was staying to the office. Didn't really have, you know, I had a flip phone then. Uh, didn't have navigation in cars. So it was like map and or you get lost. Um, yeah, you, you'd go to MapQuest, right? Oh, had map a bunch quest. of MapQuest printouts. <laughs> um, a- anyway, yeah, so I ran across the street, picked up a key. It was also Labor Day weekend. Um, actually, it was the weekend Hurricane Katrina was going through New Orleans, I believe. Um, a- anyway, uh, and what I realized in the work environment and on the island is you don't know who's local and who's not in the in, in those times during the summer. Um, and in this work environment, especially at that time, there weren't too many peers that were my age, right? And so when I went over there, uh, the lady at the front desk said, get Laren from the back. And uh, Laren came out and I was, you know, attracted to her and I was excited. I was like, wait, you, you live here? And it's like, okay, someone my age that, you know, like not only, you know, am I attracted to you, but would you want to get together? Like I have no friends. I don't even know how to get home. Oh, well, no, I know how to get home. That's actually all I know how to do. Yeah. And then, uh, she was like, yeah, sure. Great. And I was like, where do we go? (laughs) You know, I don't know of a place. And, uh, we went to, so she was a real estate agent too. Yeah, she she was uh, she had moved down from Pennsylvania, York, Pennsylvania, and just at that, that same time, uh, or or earlier in the summer. Oh, and so she was uh, in a intern kind of work, learn the business environment there, and yeah. So that that's how. Uh, what a met. positive turn of events! Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. Both of you moving down like almost at the same time. That's not right. Not knowing anybody, and then that's cool. Yeah. So yeah, what was cool is is also you know it was just, we're both from even Gastonia and York are much larger than this area, right? I've been to York many times. Okay, and and, and so you know populations of eighty and hundred thousand plus. I've got to imagine York's probably like hundred thirty, forty something, or fifty even hundred and fifty thousand. Um, uh, but you know, so so there weren't. Too many younger people that we um, knew on the island, you know, uh, that weren't in the uh, food and beverage industry. And when you work in more of the nine to five or daytime world, the realtor world is kind of all over the place. Uh, you don't exactly overlap, you know. And, and so, what was really cool is we pretty much grew up in this place together. Right, so her friends, my friends, were all the same. Became the same group of friends, and our learning experience of the area and what we like to do uh, was all together here. So that was fun. Um, it was a cool way to bond, and um, yeah, that's how we met. That's, that's a good story. Connected. Yeah, thanks. When did you guys get married? Twenty thirteen, August thirty first. Here or somewhere I hope, else? I hope that's right. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, we got married here. Uh, sea Pines Country Club. Nice. It was a beautiful sunset uh, over the marsh. Um, we even had fireworks. Yeah, it was a nice surprise from our parents. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. We got some good pictures. Uh, everybody had a great time. And, uh, yeah, it was super nice. It uh, And Labor Day weekend. It was neat to have a lot of people that were able to travel here because of being able to do it then. And, um, yeah, yeah. A lot of, uh, good stories, good wedding. Yeah. Yeah. And then when were your girls born? Uh, so Amara was born in 2015. She's now seven. Um, and then in 2018, we had Eloise. She's now four. Um, and I'm, we're good with two. 
And the question next is, well, did you want a boy? And priorities is, you know, healthy, happy. I, I actually yeah. never had a preference. And as with the CH2 article, I, I never knew I, I, I would never say I wanted to have kids. I also would say I didn't want to have kids. Uh, I like and I value family and it's critically important to me. And it's the best part of my life. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled with two. Um, and one of them could be a race car driver. Females are far more marketable in mar- motorsports, so that, that's a plus. <laughs> but uh, we love it, and we love raising them here. Got a big group of friends, and yeah. Do you need another cat or dog? Nope, nope. Uh, we just added a cat to the equation, first cat. Uh, I grew up with cats and that's, that's good. Uh, she had cats too. Um, and I think we've got the, uh, I don't know if it was IBS or something else, uh, but we, we finally got that under control with the kitten. She's getting spayed today. Uh, it's good content, right? <laughs> Great content. Good content. You haven't had that drop. No. Then we have <laughs> Lola, who's the kitchen sink of a dog. Uh, we had another amazing dog that we got in 2005 from the Humane Association, and uh, that you know grew into a 90-pound lab, best dog ever, Bentley. And then uh, when we went back, just before COVID, or right right around when COVID was starting, it it was a uh, just yeah wasn't a thing in the U.S. then. Um, so it's not like the the COVID dog get a pet and want to bring it back deal. Um, we we saw her and she looked just like a lab puppy. Uh, well, she stopped growing uh, at about a third of uh, a third of his size, and so we've got like a, a perma puppy now, right? Uh, that's got every 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 mix of every breed. She's really sweet. She's a mommy's girl, and and uh, I'm okay with that. She has the world's most ear piercing bark too. Oh yeah. Yeah. But adorable. Yeah. I hope, hope our neighbors. Well, she doesn't avidly bark outside. She chooses to bark inside in close, close proximity to you. <laughs> so we sidebarred on something back to real estate. Yep. Um, so after your first year, um, you learned a bunch, got a couple of transactions in. Um, how did you get to being the broker in charge. How long was that after you started? Yeah, so, um, you know, 2009 through 2011, I, or, or through early 2012, I actually left what was Dunes Marketing Group, which was difficult. How dare you? I know, right? Um, but no, I there were aspects of the profession that I wanted to know and understand in my own development that uh, at the time, this company wasn't, maybe as focused on. Um, and so I, I was privileged to have some exposure to go uh, work with a, a team structure um, and, and understand, you know, the, the, the pros and, and cons of that. Um, also to learn from uh, some very strong producers that, you know, we had had strong producers, but this was just a different, slightly different approach to the business yep. uh, to see how they did it and to understand uh, largely while, well, gosh, I, I think my first full year in real estate at Dunes independent, uh, did a little over 6 million in total volume. Uh, it was all buyers. I had zero sellers. Right. right? And, and so that's really what I, I needed to learn and figure out. And my scorecard continued to be, uh, extremely weighted to that one side. And so, uh, when I was reached out to that, that came about and, it was interesting. Uh, uh, it was difficult because Bill Baldwin was, has always been incredibly kind and, and supportive of me. You know, it's like going to a father figure and telling him, um, I'm, I'm leaving, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going. Um, and uh, when I shared with him my reasons for it, uh, it wasn't like, uh, you know, here's a million dollars, stay, right, kind of negotiate, which isn't really – um, which, which never solves anything. Um, it, it's, it was, I, I needed to go experience this pro- personal fulfillment, uh, and, and personal growth in my career. And that didn't mean, you know, we couldn't continue to be in touch, but we, 
lost touch, right? Uh, until about 2012, early 2012, um, he came and uh, approached me, went out uh, uh, for a beer, San Miguel's, and he, we were talking, catching up on life, and he said to me, what would you think about my job? Yes. Excuse me? Right? Come um, yeah, didn't, didn't, we haven't spoken in how long, and this is, this is kind of random. Um, but what, what he recognized, um, or, or I believe he recognized, is that w- where I was when I was with Dunes and in what I did um, while I was in, a, in another company, uh, I really loved helping people like fixing things, making things work for other people, sharing kind of my secrets of success and helping them implement it, right? Um, That gave me more satisfaction than than even a lot of the monetary reward. And, you know, um, not that I'd ever work for free because, you know, (laughs) the cat and dog have to eat, right? (laughs) Um, But uh, the, the, the... um, idea that I get to, and I was analytical, so, you know. The what do you com- mean you, wa- you yeah, were? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, you know, he, I guess, uh, recognized that, you know, I'm not, not one that likes to, to gamble on risk and really, really care about my clients and uh, probably overly addressing the risk than, than uh, being too, too, too liberal on it. Um and so, you know, in this role, th- there's really not too many on Hilton Head, right? Um, really only one other company, not, not in the top 10, that um, has a non-competing broker in charge. But I recognized, uh, it was screamingly obvious, um, in my other experience, the concept of competing against someone isn't, really as productive in your career development as having a neutral resource for yourself and your clients to go to. And then having that party really reinforce your efforts to your clients was tremendously impactful. And that's something I missed. Um, And, you know, to, to the individual development of an agent, I felt that to be, you know, challenging. And, And that, that is one of the things we discussed because it was, am I coming on, am I coming into this role to be competing and it was intended to be a five-year uh, transition uh, with him. Uh, he was quick to allow me to do the majority of the roles of uh, being a broker in charge. I was a license. I, I had taken the school and uh, I guess effect of 2007, I could have been uh, a broker in charge. Again, not that difficult. Right. Another week and a half or two weeks in the classroom and, and, and you can go so, control a lot of people, right? Sidebar real quick for yeah, the people yeah. who don't know, what is the difference between a competing broker in charge versus a non-competing broker uh, thank in charge? You. Yeah, so um, go day to day, right? A, comp- a competing broker in charge, they are out there working with their own buyers and their own sellers, right? They're going on listing appointments. They're, you know, sending out mailers. They're promoting and building their name right, and their business. And in some cases, their agents are bringing buyers to them. In some cases, they're going after the same listing, right? And so when you have, you know, these uh, broker in charges um, that, you know, you need the help and support of um, and or you're, you're going head-to-head competing against, it's – one, you're probably not likely to get it, right? I mean, you're going to work with the person who runs the company um, and, 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 and or the, and the partner of the company um, as opposed to the, the competing agent. Um, in the non-competing broker in charge scenario, um, I don't personally facilitate transactions. As you know, I'm su- incredibly involved uh, with our agents, um, get to meet with a lot of our clients. I go on a lot of listing appointments. Uh, I know what works. I know the, the metrics for, you know, uh, what we do. 
um, plugging in resources, really giving our clients the best and keeping our agents um, focused on the engagement with the client and knowing the things that they need to know. So I spend my time instead of chasing my own uh, business, my own ind individual transactions, uh, trying to help agents chase, procure more and stay ahead. Um, so I'm not distracted. Yeah, I'm not distracted by my own and, and the agents aren't uh, challenged by competing with me. And so 24 seven, and it is 24 seven, you know, I am uh, a resource to them when they have questions, when they have challenges, when they have circumstances. And there's a lot in this business that are unpredictable and, um, and, and you know, so yeah, 2012, uh, by title, uh, I think end of 2017, um, when, when Bill officially retired, um, uh, though, I would say for, for several years prior, I'd been more or less uh, fulfilling that role um, or, or the, the majority of it, which was is tremendous that he allowed me to do that early on. Um, so Dunes was always the <coughs> non-competing model? Yeah, okay. Dunes was always uh, that structure, um, it, at least it, at least since, I, I think at least since the mid-'80s, okay. right? If not uh, prior, I, I can't speak to to, to 79 when it was in the, you know, the, the single wide and, and, you know, this area and they were releasing, uh, doing some product release under, under Bill Byrne, uh, the Byrne Corporation, um, in, in tandem with, with Greenwood Communities and Resorts, the now owner, um, that was part of that transition in 2012 okay. that prompted him to reach out to me. Yeah. So competing, non-competing, that's the structure that's been the formula. Uh, prior to 2012, Dunes was heavy on the development and product release, was huge and influential in this area. And um, yeah, th then, and really my departure was to learn and understand a lot more from who, uh, those I, I deemed some of the best in the trade in this, in this environment um, and people I would trust um, to, to evolve that aspect of my profession. I did not expect to be a uh, broker in charge. I did want to develop something along the way down the road where um, I was helping more than just myself, yeah. expand and grow on the business. Um, and so that ran that random evening for that, that, that beer at San Miguel's, um, you know, I, I felt uh, a lot of purpose fulfillment in the offer and a privileged uh, uh, offering given the scarcity of it in this area. It's also a risk, right? I mean, if there's one or two and uh, things don't work out, I'm putting a lot of cards, giving up the business I had been doing on a day-to-day -day basis purely for myself. Um, but loving, supportive wife, right? Encouragement and, and a good good network of support amongst uh, the many, many great agents I'd worked with along the way. Um, I, I did make the decision, quick decision to make it happen. I did, um, one thing I did establish though, because it was new ownership at that time that I had not worked under was, um, and, and uh, Bob Self is now our president and CEO, um, of Greenwood Communities and Resorts who owns us, um, said one, I want to make sure we're not just you know, that, that, that we are a general area brokerage. We're not isolating to one area. Absolutely. You know, global domination is kind of the inside joke, right? But um, then it was, um, I'm not a quantitative guy, right? And that took a little explanation for him. And that means I don't want to just put numbers in this brokerage, right? I, I don't want you have so many models where it's just tons of agents, there's no oversight, and there's no effective way to adapt or deploy tools that are beneficial to them or their clients. And then you have, you know, every every single agent, every action one does affects every other in the, the company. And, and so, you know, there's a real quality control issue in the profession, as, it, as I've said probably 100 times now. It takes two weeks or three weeks to get a license. Um, but it was important for me to clarify that, one, I want to make sure you're on board with shifting this company to where we provide a lot of these resources and pay for them. 
for the agents and that we bring on agents that are productive and, and career focused and good integrity and that we don't try to be the, 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 the best by a measure of just numbers of agents or the best by just a turn and burn number of transactions want. Uh, and they said, absolutely. Um, shared with me a motto of, I believe it was either the grandfather or grand, grandfather, um, uh, uh, where it's, you know, give the, give the best, give the best people the best tools and you'll have the best product. Yep. Right. And so that's, uh, they were on board with that. And so we, not, not that there weren't, uh, you know, the majority quality people at Dunes in the past, I guess I don't mean to, uh, make a statement that that's what it was, but there were a lot more, right. And the average production was a lot less. Right, and, and so it's it's really cool that they've been on board with um, what was important to me, and so it made the transition easy, right, and and and, and impactful uh, for me to be able to jump in and really shape this to be a company that's able to do more than other brokerages, and in the area, all the other brokerages for for agents and and for the clients. Um, you know, both buyers and sellers. And, uh, you know, we, we've expanded our administrative support. And so our agents are able to focus on the things that are important to get them. And, you know, we get to tinker and fix the, tool, you know, hone the tools that uh, grow their grow their business. Yeah. And so that's a lot of fun. That's what we do. How has been being the broker in charge impacted you on your life, your growth, your views yeah um so obviously it broadened uh my horizons in terms of uh knowledge right uh open doors for opportunity to meet more and engage with more people um to see <clears throat> more of the ups downs lefts rights of the you know uh profession or trade as you know you don't just like when you're starting out you know, e even the uh, agent who's been in the business a long time, you're, you're going to encounter the house or the challenge or the problem that maybe it's a, uh, a function of a number of people, a function of, uh, you know, crime, be it wire fraud or, or something like that, that, uh, you know, is outside of and been fortunate not to have that kind of direct impact uh, to the company, but being tied to transactions where there's just extreme adversity, uh, it's been a real privilege to be able to encounter significant risk. And, you know, like the car that, you know, came apart and you know all the tools and you know all the equipment, but maybe there's something that's just happened inside of that that appears to be devastating how quickly can we get in there? Can we resolve it and get it back on its way? Um, you know, you, those things you encounter here and there. Far less, um, I believe, given the people that we have uh, in this company, in, in our firm, that we don't, that, that they are concerned about risk. They do look out for their clients' interests, but then there's the unpredictable. And so it shaped me and, you know, you have people that have reached out. They don't understand the circumstance. They're upset and you're trying everything you can do to help understand what it is that is their conflict or problem. Um, sometimes, I mean, <laughs> I, I've been th threatened to be, and, and I don't mean to laugh, but threatened to be sued a, a few times and uh, what i've learned is uh generally speaking when someone leads with that they're one of your least you know uh, potential threats and but you know either they were raised that way or that's what they do in that that area of the country is to to lead with that and then somehow that's going to motivate you but that that's not really what gets me going uh in um all of those cases it's and to say, okay, well, you know, what, what I've learned from, from attorneys and, and experience is you know, if you're going to do that, you know, you should put it in writing. Um, and, not, I mean, not 
I mean, literally, you speak with your attorney yeah. and, and extend it in writing. Um, but in the interim, here's my role, you know, as a facilitator, you know, here, here's our resources. Help me understand your problem because maybe, just maybe, we can fix it, right? And you can have exactly or end up exactly where you anticipated ending up. And in each of those times, it's like simple stuff. Like um, it, in the mo in what you would deem to be the most extreme, getting into this role of I'm, I'm coming after you. Of um, well, they did the inspection. There were all these problems with it. You knew, you know, we believe it was known, and uh, we're stuck in this. We're going to lose our escrow and everything. And it's like you know, what your agent's been trying to tell you, and I'm going to reinforce is this is where all those things need to be corrected right? By the way, the contract's written or structured, the seller has an obligation um, to, to, to address these conditions, look at the condition, you know, oh, oh, like, but they maybe chose not to listen or didn't hear it correctly that they had alternatives at that moment and or something missed by the inspector that's discovered uh, prior to the, you know, walkthrough. And there's certain conditions at which properties have to be conveyed. And then there's, you know, the unknowns that arise or, or, or pop up. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're all people, but learning how to reason with the, you know, conflicted has, uh, has been incredible. And then, uh, of, again, everything else is people along the way, not necessarily uh, because of my role, but maybe because of my role, I've been able to engage and be a bigger part of their life. And, and so, um, that, that, that has opened uh, doors to uh, maybe some wisdom. Uh, but, you know, recognizing that you know, everybody has uh, feelings, everybody has emotions, everybody has their own life, everyone has hardships, everyone is of value, everything has things they care about. And, you know, the real estate, the business, the transaction is, is not important. It is uh, the person and understanding what it is we're all trying to work together to accomplish and, and really digging in, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's the lessons of, uh, that I've had greater exposure to because of this role. You can read case studies, uh, and, and get a lot of experience from that, uh, in terms of managing or handling the aspects of what this business you can study up on, you know, uh, marketing and things like that to figure out, you know, tools to implement. You can, hire consultants and get a lot of that. You, you have a lot of knowledge firsthand, but um, in terms of, you know, shaping how you approach others' accomplishments and achievements and rallying uh, behind people and accomplishing a greater cause, that's uh, the, this, this, this opportunity has given me those, uh, that, that, that privilege. Weren't you also like the president of, the Association of Realtors. Yeah. yeah, Hilton Head Association of Realtors. Yep. A um, lot of influence from early on. Uh, was very involved in the uh, legislative and, and RPAC committee for the Association of Realtors. I always felt, uh, I still think it's the best committee. Um, you know, one, you're regularly in front of the people who are making the laws. I'm, I'm, I'm not politically biased one way or another. I, I say I, I vote on legislation. Uh, not not party, um, and and you know understanding things like changes in tax laws to changes in you know impact fees to things that really influence and drive um, our trade locally. Um, it, it's cool to be to to see that exposure and to understand what the Realtors Association does and what a lot of members take for granted. Um, and more people should be involved. I would say, yes, I, I like the idea of leadership, but um, I was cast into that role um, as president more so because there aren't that many people that, are, that choose to get involved in the association because there aren't so many people that, you know, step up and recognize, you know, they can accomplish more in a community than they can individually and independently. And we're in a, an environment where a lot of people are driven to have their own voice to stand apart from their competition and just be 
me, 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 I, 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 I. And so the idea of collaborating for a greater good is a large part of the reason why there's very few um, leaders in the association. And so, um, yeah, there were uh, just not many other options, right? And um, it, it's always been something we've tried to improve improve upon and we've had some awesome leaders before and after um in in, in the chain but you know that that was really cool uh being exposed more to uh some of the local you know whether it be chamber events or other leadership organizations like the home builders association being able to be on their board during my year of presidency it, it that that opened some some communication doors but um in terms of going to the next level uh, with the South Carolina Association of Realtors and having a real reach for influence and doors open there, um, that that was that was big. That, that was it, it was it was worthwhile, and and I'd do it again. Don't you hold a position now too? I well? do, I do. Uh, I had uh, chaired the uh, Legal Action Committee. Um, co-chaired it the year before, served on the committee the year prior for the state. Last year, I, when I was chairing it, I was also uh, co-chair, or, or, yeah, co-chair for the legal and ethical group chair. So I oversee, in a sense, or channel um, all the reporting. That's probably a better way of positioning it for all the uh, legal and ethical committees of the South Carolina Association of Realtors. It is an appointed position by uh, a very influential person in my uh, leadership realm, and that's uh, our, our agent, Cindy Creamer, who's the current SCR vice, or SC, South Carolina Association of Realtors president, served as president of our local association twice. And uh, yeah, that's that's somebody who does this, yeah, just, yeah, is at the core in terms of beliefs of, leadership serving the greater good and working very hard for their clients and being an advocate, you know, for, for private property rights and uh, something. We've got a lot of leaders in this group. That was something I was going to bring up. That's something that when I started working here, I've I've noticed not coming from a real estate background, just how many leaders in the community and in the real estate space we have here. Yeah. So Cindy's the president of, Basically, all of the realtors in South Carolina. That's right? right. Correct me if I'm wrong. Kathy Schroeder will be the president of the Island Association. Yep. You have the legal. Um, Gloria is a massive advocate. Gloria and Alan Laco. Yep. In the community. Yep. Um, you're good. Sorry. <laughs> um, who am I forgetting? Oh yeah, and and basically everybody. <laughs> Gloria and, and uh, was realtor of the year the year before. Yeah, she was the state recognized uh, Dancy Joiner, which is kind of like the community service realtor of the year ish um, uh, acknowledgement or achievement. Uh, Jeff Hunt's current Hilton Head Area Association Realtor of the Year. Um, John Robinson is a former president of the local association, as I mentioned earlier, Cindy Twice. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, um, and yeah, there's a lot of leaders, um, a lot of committee chairs, and you know, why we like leaders and why clients should really value it and appreciate it is leaders really care for the people they serve. 100%. And so it's rare do you have a leader that's in there and you certainly don't have one in this kind of, the, the rewards of, uh, you know, <laughs> of, of recognition and title are, are not, are not, do not warrant um, a, a selfish endeavor. Um, it, it's a selfless, um, I, I guess that kind of sounds selfish if I've served and I'm saying that, but uh, you know, I, I truly believe that you know, they, they have a care or concern um, for others and, and the bigger cause and picture, and they pretty much stop at no, you know, there's nothing that takes them off the course of serving those that are, you know, working on behalf of, and that's, that's why, I mean, in our pursuit of great agents and delivering great resources, we want to align with people who value the same things we do. And that's, you know, ultimately in the business we, we, we serve, that's the buyer and seller. 
and uh, administratively as a as a company um, to like yourself, um, our agents are also our clients, and um, you know so we're keeping them focused and keep building and growing their careers. And you know we have we, yeah, Linda, who I mentioned earlier, is onto woman of the year local. You know that's uh, the women's uh, professional um, organization and. It's a big recognition uh, at the Chamber event. Someone's nominated each year. Gloria Lico has also been one um, or, or, or recognized with that award um, in the past. So, yeah, you know, people look out for one another in the sense of, you know, not like, hey, look out for one another, you know, <laughs> I can, you know, got your back. Um, but, you know, take good care and the right decisions yeah. are made. So back to what made my transition easier. That's, that's our culture. That's our company. Right. So, yeah. So as we start to wrap this up, cause we've been at this for almost hour and 20 minutes. You won't stop talking. Hey, I just ask questions and let you talk. Perfect. So we're going to do a quick rapid fire round. Perfect. Um, I asked the hard hitting questions now, right? Beat your boat. boat. I, I already know the answer. <laughs> boat. Yep. Um, let's see. You guys are going out, family, together? Mm-hmm. Where are you going? It's a nice, beautiful 85-degree day. Yeah, boat. Boat, probably. Uh, beach, possibly. Uh, restaurant, possibly. Which, which restaurant? Uh, kids. So, uh, Mellow Mushroom, Local Pie, um, Crazy Crab, something like that. I do love local pie. Yeah. It's very good. Yeah. All right. The kids? Dune's house. Another good one. Yeah. The, ki- the yeah. kids are love with... run out to the beach. Kids are with family or babysitter. It's date night. Yeah. Where are you going? Uh, excellent question. We've long... Favorite. There's there's a lot of good local restaurants. We 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 love to go to Alexander's. Uh, love to sit at the bar and have a good drink, and, and then sit down for a great meal. We really enjoy. Um, uh, gosh, I'm, I'm blanking. I can't think of the the name of the place off of New Orleans Road. Uh, Italian, Michael Anthony's. Uh, enjoy Michael Anthony's. We've, um, yeah, those are. <laughs> we we do like. We, we've had many n- nights. We had a lot of date nights during uh, COVID just because outdoor uh, location. We, we enjoyed uh, Dune's house and going for a walk on the beach. I mean, it's not much better than that. We like Santa Fe, uh, sitting outdoors, uh, upstairs, outside. Uh, it's always been nice. And then uh, there's so many places in Bluffton now that, that we really enjoy going. And, you know, especially in the summertime when the places on the island are being well patroned by um, visitors, right? Is that a word? Yeah. Patroned? Okay. All right. You ready for, this is, this is a really hard-hitting, tough question. Yeah, sure. Where do you see yourself in five years as a drone pilot? Okay. Well, I was going to say Indy 500, but you went a different direction. Um, no, I'm not. I'm not. That's, uh, at some point, I won't have a drone Right. That's sad. It'll be on one of the, uh, either the intercoastal waterway or at, you know, stuck in, in, in pluff mud somewhere that's non-recoverable. Uh, and then I'll say, well, that was fun. You know, hope we got the clips we wanted. All right. But on a serious note, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Where do you see the company? Yeah. Um, great. I, we, we, we have made some great additions and we're doing some expansion. Uh, we're pretty conservative with our expansion because as you know, and you're, you're a big part of this, we provide resources to our agents like what you do. Yeah. Uh, professional photography, videography, Matterport scans. And, you know, if you have more and more agents or too many agents in and you do that and you help run their business and grow and expand, then, you know, you throw a bunch, you know, you throw 10, 20, 30, you lose your ability to be effective for each one. So um, we'll scale cautiously. Um, We'll expand within the county. 
well, um, you know, our company owns an insurance company. We own uh, or are under the at-large umbrella. Um, we'll find our way into more um, complementary um, ancillary uh, business scenarios, but we will not be the biggest by transaction sides. We will not be the biggest uh, by agent quantity, uh, but we will be the best by brand quality. reputation and people. Yeah, I should have said quality, but that too. Yeah. Right, Where do you see yourself in 10 years? <sighs> Professional drone pilot? Because I gave it up and someone had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Maybe with one of those crazy FPV drones, they fly, like, fly in movies with like a gimbaled camera on top. Okay. Maybe we'll end up getting one of those and doing like crazy movie quality walkthrough videos. Okay. Yeah, of like uh, fast moving tiny homes or something. Yeah. Or, or houseboats. Yeah. Or like that. imagine flying one of those through like an oceanfront home. That'd be a pretty cool video. That would be fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we'd, we'd, we'd want to visit our insurance plan. Definitely. Hey, it's a good thing we have an insurance company under the umbrella. The, 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 the hurricane uh, proof or um, rated glass on those, it's really hard to, to, to break, right? Imagine flying one of those drones through a hurricane. No, you can't. Yeah, you could probably. It's a topic for me. Batteries today. don't last long. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's the challenging part. Well, Daniel, thank you for your time. Connor, thank you. This, it's been fun. This was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think anybody's going to listen 100%. to this entire thing? 100%. Really? Yes. Okay. We have one extremely avid listener who listens to every single podcast from start to finish. It's not me. Okay. Shout out to my mom. Thank you, Connor's mom. Yeah. So. We appreciate it. She she always listens to all of them before, okay. I, before I post them. Good. Good. So, well, I. I uh, you'll it, get at least one. If there was something of value or, or a question you had and you put put a question down in the comment below it or shoot me an email, I'll do my best to answer it. Yeah. So to end off, uh, where can people find you? Where can people reach you? Do you have social media? Yeah. So I'm, I'm about six days a week in the office um, through anything we do for Dunes Real Estate. Um, I, I monitor that. You know, our page, our account, our analytics, our advertising. So when people are like, how how'd you know? that or I posted that it's like I kind of do that early on in social media I had an account uh when Facebook was only in college and it was like 2004 when it was coming out and I, yeah to have a dot edu uh I was pretty you know heavy into it and man it's a suck of time and a total distraction to what you do and so it was maybe 2008 2009 where it's like okay what are the benefits and how do you derive it towards the business and what do I need to do so effectively advertising stuff like that uh anything that would be posted or somehow you know uh yeah if they came to any of our social media presence um website inquiry to daniel well yeah daniel at dunes real estate.com will, will get to me um and uh in the office pretty much at least six days out of the week Try to keep stay away on Saturdays uh, if I can, and on birthdays. Yeah, be on the I'm lookout. Daniel's going to be starting a TikTok, and he's going to go viral doing TikTok dances. So, thank you for listening to the Behind the Dunes podcast. Catch you next week. <laughs>